And, um, and let me talk about uh, the midterm. So the midterms on Monday, right? Your first midterm exam. I know it's so crazy. I can't believe, I can't decide if this quarter is dragging on or is going on super fast. It feels like both simultaneously, which, you know, I know it's not physically possible, but emotionally, that's how it feels. Okay. Um, all right, so your midterms on Monday, uh, it's gonna be one hour. And um, let's see, what did I write? Okay, so it's open note, open book. You can consult Wikipedia, the R help files. I'm gonna lock up campus wire for the day, okay? And, uh, and students are not allowed to talk to each other, okay? Um, you will log on to, um, or maybe I'll just say don't, talk about anything on the exam on campus? I don't know. Okay, well, anyway. So you'll log into Zoom with your cameras on, microphones muted, okay? And, um, and I've got two exams scheduled and you can either take the exam at 10 a.m. or at 10 p.m. You don't need to tell me when. This is 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. California time, uh, local time here for me. And, um, and just show up and uh, those two time slots should work out for everybody um, globally, I think, all right? So I know 10 a.m. is like two in the morning for some people, but then 10 p.m. will be two in the afternoon. So, so that should work, okay? And then um, uh, there will be, it'll be a mix of pen and paper and a little bit of R scripting. The R scripting shouldn't be too crazy, okay? Um, so, and I think uh, basically, I've got three problems with a few parts each, and uh, and I think one hour, um, you know, I, I think one hour will fit everything. Okay, um, to make sure your R stuff works with me, make sure you update your R to you know a, a current version. Uh, I think the current release is 4.0.3. I think 4.0 or later should be fine. Okay, I mean. And just do, um, and you can kind of just verify, do set seed one, R unif six, and it should spit out these numbers, okay? And, uh, and if so, we're probably good. Okay, so um, I guess logistically, are there any questions just about the logistics? You're gonna submit some stuff onto Gradescope, submit some stuff in, um, and then the script, uh, you'll probably upload to CCLE, I think, um, I'll, I'll post like an RMD template as well. The RMD template is going to be very basic. It's going to be like your answer to problem one and your answer to problem two. Okay, there's there's not going to be much on the RMD template, but it uh, it'll be there. Okay, and uh, and you'll submit that um, on CCLE. Okay, any questions on just logistics? How is this this part's going to work? All right, okay. So um, problem one is gonna be a Bayesian inference with a conjugate prior, all right? And so I'm gonna provide a, a small sample of data that come from a specified distribution, all right? And, uh, and the distribution is gonna be one of these, all right? Either exponential, Poisson, binomial, negative binomial, gamma, or normal, all right? So what's that, six? Six distributions, it's gonna be one of those. I will provide the PDF of the distribution, uh, and uh, you know, with the data, you will find the likelihood function for you know one of the parameters. Okay, so um, so you'll find the likelihood function of of the data. Okay, and it's going to be one of these, and that's going to be done on pen and paper. Okay, and I'll also provide the conjugate prior distribution for one of the um, parameters. So. Um, and then uh, using um, the data and the conjugate prior, you're gonna figure out the posterior distribution. And, uh, and you'll do that um, via pen and paper as well, all right? And then once you have the posterior distribution, you'll use Monte Carlo integration to estimate the expected value of a, certain, of a probability, right? So for example, in, um, in lecture, uh, we had a, you know, a, a binomial, data came from a binomial distribution. 
the conjugate prior was a beta distribution. We found the posterior distribution of basically the batting average or the probability of getting a hit. And once we had the probability of getting a hit, then um, we could then find the expected value of getting two hits in the next three at bats. So the, uh, you know, to get the expected value, we did Monte Carlo integration there, right? And then, so that part we'll use R and then you'll kind of report your answer with pen and paper, but you'll also kind of put your answer in the R script. All right. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? All right, so, so I think you had problems like this in the homework. In the homework, you had um, uh, the, the baseball example with uh, data coming from binomial with a beta prior. You had uh, an example where I think the, um, the values came from an exponential distribution and uh, had a gamma prior. Um, just from trying to remember off the top of my head what your homework looks like. And then you also had uh, data from, from a normal and, um, and you had one observation. The normal one was, a, you know, kind of a bit of a pain to, um, to derive, uh, but it, you know, then again, your, your, your exam is open, open notes. So you can always kind of consult open note and you can look at Wikipedia and stuff. Okay, um, problem two uh, is going to be done using R. You'll do Monte Carlo integration and you'll do important sampling. Okay, so I'm going to give you some kind of arbitrary function and you will estimate the integral of the function on a certain interval using Monte Carlo integration. That should be fairly straightforward. Um, you'll, you know, you'll uh, propose values probably from some uniform distribution and then do the appropriate calculations to get the uh, estimate of the integral. All right, and then uh, so you know this this is going to be very similar to um, your homework assignment. This the the one that you guys have been working on this week. Okay, and um, and then the the next second part of uh, problem two is I will specify a different distribution to sample from. Right, so um, and then you'll estimate the integral of the function um, using important sampling. Okay, and so in your homework. Uh, you know, you had the you had to find the estimate, you had to estimate the integral of you know some function, and then and then I, we changed it up. So rather than proposing from the uniform, you would propose from the normal distribution. But technically, it was a little bit different because we truncated the normal distribution. So you had to like multiply by a constant, so it became a PDF, so that the thing would integrate to one. So, you know, so you might have to do something like that here. Okay, where you just. Uh, figure out, um, you know, what, what constant you need to do to do that. Okay. Um, any questions there? So if, if you understand the, uh, the homework and, uh, and how the homework questions worked, I, I hope this will be, um, at least familiar and feeling pretty straightforward here. Okay. Hang on a second. Let me, um, So that's um, number two. All right, and then problem three, um, this will be inverse uh, CDF method. And, uh, and we've had a few examples in the, uh, the lecture notes. Um, you haven't had a homework problem with this yet, but uh, you've had some examples in the lecture notes. Uh, I will provide some kind of PDF, all right? And then, uh, and based on the PDF, you will have to figure out the CDF. So that will be doing some uh, integration. With, uh, with calculus, and then you'll have to find the inverse of the CDF, okay? And then I will provide arbitrary values of U, and you will um, basically plug those values of U into your inverse CDF and tell me what values X that those values correspond to, okay? And, and so problem three will be done uh, entirely with pen and paper, there's no, um, no R, you know, I guess, I guess you can use a calculator or R to kind of plug in, you know, uh, like if, you know, if you need to plug in some value, you, you plug that in, get the square root or something, that's fine. But, but this is, you know, mostly gonna be done in pen and paper. Okay, so, the, so finding the CDF, you know, uh, you'll have to do some integration there, so you, I don't know how long it's been been since you had to integrate something, but 
you know, maybe just look up a little bit of integral stuff, right? Okay, it's been too long, right? So, um, like if I put in uh, a trig function, right? Like if the PDF's like cosine and, and you have to integrate that or something like, that's, I think that's reasonable, okay. Um, it's not gonna be crazy, okay? Uh, probably you don't have to integrate by parts, but um, just, um, um, just some, just uh, basic integral stuff, right? Finding the CDF and then inverting it, inverting the uh, the CDF. Um, that that's algebra, but um, you know, if you forgot how to complete the square, like that, at least I showed you in the notes how to complete the square. Okay. Um, questions? Is this okay? All right, and I'll post this document up, document up on CCLE. Okay, so um, so you have that. Uh, okay, all right. Um, let's get started. It's uh, it's Friday, third week Friday. It uh, I don't know if it feels like the quarter's going super fast or super slow. It feels like both simultaneously, a little bit for me. Um, okay. Uh, let me give you your first quiz answer for um, uh, for today. Uh, first quiz answer is E as an elephant. E as an elephant is your first quiz answer. Okay. All right. Question. Uh, we submit a scan of our paper and the R script. Yes. So you will submit the uh, scan of your paper on Gradescope, and then the R script. Uh, I'm currently planning that you'll submit that on CCLE. Now, I heard Gradescope is able to accept code as well, so I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll look into that possibility. But basically, you'll you'll submit two things: a scan of your paper and and the R script. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if we have a tablet, can you use that? Yes, if you have a tablet, you can use that to you know you can write directly on your tablet and submit um, a PDF of your work. Will we have time at the end to submit everything? Uh, yeah, so the uh, the cutoff deadline will be like 11.10. So the exam will start at 10 a.m. And then the cutoff will be 11.10. Um, so basically, I'm giving you one hour for the exam and then 10 minutes for the scanning and the uploading, OK? Now, don't, don't tempt the uh, internet gods by working until like 11.08 and giving yourself only two minutes to scan and upload, right? Because that's when your internet's going to cut out and you're going to get disconnected or something, okay? So, so don't do that. You know, 11, give yourself, give yourself some cushion. Give yourself at least 10 minutes to scan and upload. Um, so um, uh, the slides have not been posted because I had issues knitting my LaTeX thing because I was missing a curly brace, and um, I just got it fixed. So I haven't posted the slides. I'll, I think I've, I've I noticed some typos, so I'm going to correct them and I'll, I'll post them up. So, so for now, you're just going to have to uh, follow along on the uh, on the screen here. Okay. All right. And I gave you your first quiz answer, which was E, E as an elephant. Okay. All right. So uh, today we're looking at rejection sampling. All right. Rejection sampling is another method for generating um, random values from a distribution. And the reason why we want to do this is that you know for Monte Carlo integration, we have to be able to generate values from some specified distribution, right? To get uh, the expected value of some function h, h of x, where x is coming from a random distribution, we need to be able to generate values from that random distribution. And um, you know, our life has been made easy because R has all these built-in random generator functions. But if we didn't have a random generator function, we would need to, uh, we need some of these methods, okay? So um, so we we first learned like the linear congruential generator, which we're not gonna use, we're just gonna use our unif, but if we needed to generate random uniform numbers, we can with the linear congruential generator. And then, uh, and then from there, we looked at inverse CDF and we're able to generate a whole bunch of values using inverse CDF. And then today, here's another method where you can generate values from a distribution if, like inverse CDF method doesn't work for you, right? So 
if it's difficult to find the CDF or the inverse of the CDF, then rejection sampling could work, okay? Uh, rejection sampling is, uh, I guess, a little bit less efficient because some of the values are gonna get rejected. All right, so this is kind of um, how it's gonna work is uh, the goal is you wanna generate a random sample from distribution F and we know the PDF of F, but we, we either don't know the inverse CDF or we can't generate directly from F, okay? But you know, you do have to know the PDF of F, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a candidate distribution G, okay? And we're able to sample from this distribution G. So there's some similarities between uh, important sampling and rejection sampling. Um, but the key difference is that rejection sampling is used to generate a sample, whereas important sampling is used to kind of is, is basically a version of Monte Carlo integration where you are like weighting the, uh, the values, okay? So in important sampling, you kind of accept everything, but you weight um, what gets proposed or, you know, the values generated. Here, we're actually gonna reject some of the values. Okay, so we have a candidate distribution G and the rule is that the support of F must be fully contained inside the support of G. So that wherever F is greater than zero, G is also greater than or equal to zero. And what we need to do is we need to find a constant M so that M times G of X is always greater than or equal to F of X um, for, all, for all of X, okay, inside the support. Okay, so we need, um, so this is what we need to do, okay? Because so g of x is a PDF, right? And so g of x is a PDF, which means it integrates to one. F of x is also a PDF that integrates to one. And, and unless f of x and g of x are exactly the same, there's gonna be some spots where f of x is less than g of x. And if f of x is less than g of x in some spots and it has the same area as, and they both have the same area one, then that means there must be spots where um, g of x is less than f of x, right? In order, in order for the both things to have the area one, there's gotta be some spots where f is greater than g and some spots where g is greater than f, okay? And so what we need to do is we need to find some constant and we're just gonna say, okay, let's take g of x and we're gonna multiply it by a constant so that it's always bigger than f, <laughs> okay? And so the most efficient choice of M is going to be the maximum value of F divided by G, F of X divided by G and nothing bigger than that. Okay. If we pick anything smaller than this, anything smaller than the maximum of F over G, it's not going to satisfy this condition that M times G of X is always greater than or equal to F. Okay. Because if I, if I divide G of X, both sides by G of X, um, you know, M has to be greater than or equal to F of X over G of X for all X, okay? All right, so this is how rejection sampling is gonna work. You're gonna generate values of X from G, okay? And then you're gonna calculate this ratio. This is F of X divided by M times G of X. So M times G of X is always gonna be greater than or equal to F, right? So when you multiply G times M, it's always gonna be at least greater than or equal to F, which means this ratio is always gonna be between zero and one. Okay, the ratio will never be greater than one because we've, we've picked an M so that M times G of X is always gonna be at least bigger than F, okay? So the ratio is always gonna be uh, between zero and one, and then we're gonna generate a random value U between zero and one, a random uniform value. And if that uniform value comes in less, then this quantity, this quantity R of X or this ratio F divided by M times G of X, we're going to accept X as a sample from F of X, okay? Otherwise, we're gonna reject X and repeat, all right? And, and we just kind of keep doing this and, uh, and we just keep the accepted ones, we throw away the rest and the accepted values will be a sample from F. So, um, so I'm gonna just start us off with kind of a simple example, all right? So the beta two, two distribution is basically an upside down parabola, parabola all right? So if you, if you look at the PDF 
of the beta distribution, you plug in X, it's going to be, you know, it's that gamma thing, X, X to the A minus one, so X to the two minus one is X, one minus X to the B minus one, so you get X times one minus X times six, right? And so the integral of this will equal one. Okay, and that it's, uh, it's bounded on the interval zero to one. Now, technically, we can sample directly using our beta, and we can also, it's not going to be hard to figure out the inverse CDF of this thing, okay? Like figuring out the CDF of this and the inverse CDF, not hard, okay? But we're going to use rejection sampling. All right, and so for rejection sampling, what we need is a candidate distribution. So the candidate distribution just needs to at least cover the interval 0 and 1. It could go bigger than that, but... Um, but uh, X being um, zero to one works. And so we can just use the uniform distribution, okay? Uniform on zero to one. And if we use uniform on zero to one, G of X is equal to one. Okay, so G of X is one on the interval zero to one. And, and so this support of G works with the support of F. So we're good. Okay, so here is the plot of F in red. And the plot of g of x is in orange. Okay, so g of x is right here at one, f of x is red. Okay, so what we need to do, and, and so right now, if, uh, if I did f divided by g, there's going to be some spots where f divided by g is greater than one. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to multiply g times some constant m. So I need a constant m such that m times g of x is always going to be greater than or equal to f. Okay. So just kind of visually, what value of M should I pick? You can just enter it in the chat or speak up. Just visually, what, what do you think M should be? Yeah, 1.5-ish, okay, 1.5, exactly, all right? Because what we can see is that G is, is a constant, it's one, and then it looks like the maximum value of the red line is 1.5, so I just take this and I multiply it by 1.5 and, and we'll see that it's going to be always greater than uh, the red line. Okay. And so, you know, just visually we can see it should be 1.5 and, um, and indeed we can uh, figure this out, right? So the most efficient choice of M is going to be the max of F, F of X divided by G of X and nothing bigger than that, right? So F of X is 6X times 1 minus X and G of X is equal to 1. So we need to find the, the max of f of x divided by g of x. So this is going to be 6x times 1 minus x divided by 1. All right, and then I'm going to take the derivative of this, set it equal to 0, and we're going to find that the maximum occurs at x equal to 0 0.5. And so the maximum, if I plug in 0 0.5, the maximum is equal to 1.5. And so the most efficient choice is going to be m equal to 1.5, which is exactly what you guys said. All right, so that matches just intuitively what we see when we look at it. And so the max is going to be 1.5. OK, and so um, when I plot this, F is in red, G is in orange, and then M times G is in blue. And we can see the blue line is always greater than the red line. I, I have these labeled wrong. F, F is in. F's in red and G is in orange. I gotta, I gotta fix that. Okay. Okay. F is red and G is orange. Okay, so I'll, I'll fix that here. All right, and then we're gonna run the algorithm. Okay. So I'm gonna generate um, values. From, uh, from the uniform distribution, because that's my proposal distribution, right? So my proposal distribution is just uniform 0, 1. So when I run my algorithm, I'm going to just generate uh, a bunch of values from the uniform distribution. These are going to be my proposed values of x, OK? And the ratio is f divided by m times g of x. So uh, we generate from g, which is the uniform. And then we're going to calculate this ratio, which is f divided by m times g. Now, I've, I've written <laughs> f divided by m times g, but m is 1.5 and g is equal to 1. So this is just equivalent to f of x divided by 1.5. So it's, it's, it's a little silly writing this as a, as a function, but 
but I've, I've written it formally out. Okay, so this is the same as doing f times the proposed f of the proposed value divided by 1.5. Okay, and uh, and this this will always be between zero and one, and then I'm going to generate u from random uniform. And if u is less than this ratio, this acceptance ratio, then we're going to accept it. Okay, so accepted is going to be a logical vector of trues and falses. Uh, and it's true when u is less than r, r underscore x, rx. Okay, and then uh, and then I'm going to subset the proposed values using my logical vector of true falses, and this will be my accepted values of x. Okay, and so here is a histogram of the accepted values of x, and I've plotted this against the beta density density of the um, beta density, beta 2, 2 density. And we can see our histogram matches the um, theoretic density pretty well. Okay, so that, that's pretty good. Uh, here, I've plotted the um, CDF. Uh, and I should probably add some labels to my plots here. Okay, so this is the plot of the CDF in red. And I'm plotting it against the empirical CDF of the accepted values. And we can see that that lines up very well. So that's good. And then here is a plot of basically um, kind of 300 of these values, right? And I'm plotting basically uh, the first 300 proposed values. And we can see, um, and the vertical position is basically a representation of the, the u value that gets generated, okay? So uh, here I'm multiplying u times m. And, um, and basically, if, if it comes in underneath the curve, it's gonna get accepted. And if it ends up higher than the curve, it's gonna get rejected, all right? And so we can see that we're basically scattering uniform dots in this, in the region underneath the blue line. And, um, and what we're getting is basically uh, dots, um, dots underneath the, the red line get accepted, dots above it get, get rejected. And, uh, and so this is how we get a distribution that looks like this. All right. Does that kind of make sense? Is that all right? Okay, let me give you your second quiz answer. Second quiz answer is B, B as in bear, B, second quiz answer. Okay, um, so the empirical acceptance rate is how many values we accepted divided by how many we proposed. All right, so we proposed 100,000 and I accepted 66,658. So my acceptance ratio is this, all right? And then the theoretic acceptance rate is going to be one over m. Okay. And the reason why the theoretic acceptance rate is one over m is that f and g are both PDFs. Okay. So that means the integral of f of x and the integral of g of x are both going to equal one. Okay. So if I integrate f of x, I get one. If I integrate g of x, I get one. And so the integral of m times g of x is going to equal m. And so if we think of kind of the, the proportion of m times g of x that's covered by f of x, if I do f of x divided by m times g of x, f of x is 1 divided by m times g of x, which is m, that area is going to be 1 over m. Okay, so the theoretic acceptance rate is, is going to be 1 over 1 and a half or 2 thirds here. All right. Uh, let's try another example, okay? So let's say um, I've got another PDF, another PDF sine of x, all right? And um, and sine of x is a PDF on the interval zero to pi over two, okay? So if you go from zero to pi over two, which is basically uh, you know the first ninety degrees of the um, unit circle getting swept out, um, that's going to integrate to one, right? From 0 to pi over 2, this integrates to 1. And so for a candidate distribution, um, we can use the uniform uniform distribution. So pi over 2 is like 1.57-ish, something around there. 
And so um, here I can just generate uniform values from zero to pi over two, zero to 1.57 ish, okay? And that's gonna have a PDF of two divided by pi. Okay, so this is this has a PDF of two over pi on the interval zero to pi over two. So this this thing will integrate to one on this interval. Okay, and you know they have the same support, so we're we're okay, we're good. All right, and so what we need is we need to find a constant m, so that m times g of x is always going to be greater than or equal to f of x, right? So the max of f of x is one, and then the the max of g of x is going to be 2 over pi. Okay, So the choice of m of f divided by g of x, yeah, I didn't bother with the showing the work here, but that's going to be pi over 2, right? Is that okay? So I'm going to, if I take g of x and I multiply it by pi over 2, then g of x will equal 1, and that will satisfy this condition that it always has to be greater than the sine of x. Okay. So uh, here is the plot. In red, we have f, which is sine of x. Okay. Uh, in orange, we have g, which is uh, pi, uh, 2 over pi, like 0.6 something. And then if I multiply 2 over pi times pi over 2, that gives me 1, and that's the blue. Okay. So m times g is going to be in blue, and that's here. And we can see that the blue line is always greater than or equal to the red line. All right, good. OK, so then uh, we'll run the algorithm. Uh, I'm going to generate uh, 100,000 values. And so the proposal distribution this time is the uniform distribution from 0 to pi over 2. All right, so these are going to be my proposed values of x. And here, my acceptance ratio is going to be f divided by m times g. Okay, Now, m times g is just equal to 1. So it, it's a little silly <laughs> to, uh, to include this. But you know, m, m is pi over 2, and g is 2 over pi. Um, so m times g is just 1. So you know, r of x is just f. Right? So if, if I look at what g of x, right, g is just 2 over pi. And uh, okay, so anyway, um, I generate uniform values, and we will accept if u is less than this ratio, and uh, and then we subset the proposed values based on whether um, on the values that were accepted. All right, and so here is a plot of my histogram compared to the. Um, theoretic density, which is the, uh, which is g of x, sine of x, okay? And, uh, and we can see that they match up, which is what we want. All right, um, the PDF is gonna be one minus cosine of s, okay? So, um, so that goes from zero to one, and we can see that this also lines up. And the, um, and, I'm sorry, the CDF, the empirical CDF versus the theoretic CDF in red. And here's a plot of kind of all of my proposed values and what got accepted. Right, so so we, we proposed values anywhere from 0 to 1.57. And you know, if we proposed values near 0, OK, like if we, let's say we proposed a value at like 0.2, OK? Well, most of those values are going to get rejected. Okay, so at point two, we would only accept it if u comes in less than less than say point two. Okay, um, whereas if u comes in anything greater than point two, it's going to get rejected. So all of these values that were um, all of these values that were proposed got rejected because u came in too great. Um, whereas these values were under the threshold line under the f of x, and so we we accepted those. Okay. All right. So it's a little bit silly that I'm doing m times this because this just ends up being one. Okay. All right. Is that okay? Any questions on this?
All right. So, um, all right. Let's say we have <clears throat> we uh, we're gonna do this one. This so so far my proposal di distributions have been uniform. I've had uniform uh, zero to one. Uh, I had a uniform zero to pi over two, uh, but now my proposal distribution g of x is not going to be uniform. It's going to be this exponential thing. Okay, so we've seen the folded normal distribution before. It's basically the normal distribution but folded, and if we kind of do the uh, standard normal, we fold it in half, then the PDF is going to be two times this, right? So we're going to take um, two times this. So it's going to be twice as tall. So this is my f of x, okay? And my g of x, um, I'm going to use the ex exponential with a rate of one as my distribution, right? So the exponential is lambda e to the negative lambda x with lambda equal to one. I just have e to the negative x, all right? And so both of them have a support of x greater than or equal to zero. So, so this works as a proposal distribution, okay? All right, so um, to plot this, I kind of cheated a little bit and I'm just gonna use the normal density function inside R. I'm gonna just do two times the normal density function and that gets plotted in red. And G, I'm just gonna plot the exponential density, okay? Use R's uh, exponential density function. Okay, and so when I plot this, okay, both of these will integrate to one if I go from zero to infinity. And, but what we see here is that, okay, there are some parts where the orange line, the exponential is taller than the red line. Okay, but then there's also some parts where the orange line is below or the red line is taller than the orange line. Okay, and the orange is my proposal distribution. And what I need to do is I need to find a constant M so that when I multiply the orange times uh, when I multiply m times the orange line, okay, m times g, it's going to be greater than the red line everywhere. Okay, so I just need to find some constant so that the orange line, when I multiply it by a constant, it will always be greater than the red line. Okay, and so again, the most efficient choice of m is going to be the maximum value of f divided by g, right? So if I take the ratio between the red and the orange, if I do red divided by orange, what's the maximum value of that? That should be my choice M here. So I wanna find the maximum of F divided by G. So F, this is the PDF of F, two times basically the normal density. I've got E to the negative X squared over two. The density of G is E to the negative X. And so I need to find the maximum of e to the negative x squared over two minus x. So the max of e to the negative x squared over two minus x is gonna occur at the minimum of x squared over two minus x, right? Okay, and so I didn't bother with this, but with a little calculus, we can see that the minimum is gonna occur at x equal to one, all right? And so if I plug in x equal to one into this, where the m is gonna be, um, the maximum value of this, so I plug in one because that's going to be the maximum value of this. I'm going to get two over root two pi e to the one half, and that calculates to around 1.32. Okay, and we should always round up because we need m to be at least this. So don't round down, even if it's like 1.309 or 1.3001. Okay, you got to round up because you need m to be at least greater than um, that value. So you never want to round down. Okay, so anyway, we're gonna just pick 1.32. All right, and so when, when I plot this, so here is the or, original and G is in orange, but if I G, do G times M and I plot that in blue, we can see the blue line is gonna be uh, greater than or equal to the red line everywhere. Okay, and they just barely, they, they touch right here. Okay, but G times, um, m times the blue line, m times g is the blue line, and we can see the blue line is greater than or equal to the red line everywhere, which is what we want. All right, is that okay now? All right, so now I'll just go ahead and I'll run through the algorithm, okay? This time, my proposed values of x 
are generated by the exponential distribution, okay? Now, I could have also used inverse CDF method um, to generate values from the exponential distribution. I would do uh, U from random uniform and then plug that into um, negative times this square root of log U, right? So that, that's how you would get the um, exponential values. Okay, so, um, but anyway, or no, just negative log U, I forget. Okay, but anyway, I'm generating values from the random, uh, from the exponential distribution at random. And now, um, now this M times G of X is not a constant, okay? So F is, uh, I take my proposed value of X and I plug it into F, which is gonna be, be basically two times the normal density. And then, um, and I'm gonna take my proposed value X and I plug it into G, which is the exponential density times M, which is 1.32. Okay, and that will give me my ratio. And then U is a, a random uniform value. And we will accept it if U is less than R over X. And then, um, and we subset our proposed values based on this logical vector of accepted, of true, accepted true falses. And so when I plot the, um, the histogram of my accepted values, it matches the um, desired density very well. And here is a plot of the uh, CDF. Okay, the CDF looks like this and my empirical CDF matches, which is what we wanna see. And this is what the, uh, the plot looks like this time, okay? So this time we're, we're proposing values from the exponential. So I can propose basically any value from zero to infinity, okay? Basically values greater than like five are very unlikely to get proposed from the exponential di distribution. It's not zero, but fairly unlikely, okay? And so I've, I've plotted these and basically the values that um, come under the curve get accepted and values, um, uh, greater than f of x uh, get rejected, okay? And so what we can see is that, um, you know, when, when values are extreme, values like four and five don't get proposed very often. And when they do get proposed, they don't get accepted very often, okay? And then values around two don't get proposed very frequently, okay? Because the exponential distribution is fairly low there to begin with. Uh, so they don't get proposed frequently. And when they do get proposed, only about half of them get accepted, okay? Whereas values near zero get proposed a lot under the exponential distribution, okay? And, um, and of those, you know, maybe around 70% uh, of them or 60 something percent of them get accepted because the exponential distribution proposes values near zero a little bit too frequently, okay? And so we can see, um, this is kind of uh, what gets accepted and what gets rejected here, okay? Um, all right, any, uh, any questions on this? No? Okay, well, um, let me give you your last quiz answer. Last quiz answer is A as an apple a as an apple, that's your uh, last quiz answer for today, third week Friday. And uh, we'll end here. I'll, uh, I got a couple typos to fix up, uh, but I'll fix them up and I'll post these notes onto, uh, onto CCLE. Uh, I'll also post the uh, kind of midterm topics file um, so you guys can look at that. And, uh, and good luck as you guys study. And we will see you guys on Monday uh, for the midterm exam, either at 10 a.m. or 10 p.m., okay, California time. So uh, log in either at 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. Um, I, you should probably log in just a couple minutes early. Um, and so we'll see you, uh, we'll see you on Monday. Okay, uh, conceptual questions on the midterm? No, uh, what I put on the, um, um, those midterm topics, that's, that's what the, the exam will look like that, okay? Uh, any advice studying for the test? I'd say just look over those topics and make sure you understand and, and can do all those things. You can make yourself some practice problems. I think um, in previous quarters, like students made up practice problems for each other and put them on campus wire and 
um, I think that's good. Okay. All right. Good luck to you guys. We'll see you on Monday. Um, good luck studying. So I'll see you then.